Imagine today you woke up and you have a slight pain in your leg, but you don't think too much of it. Sometimes this happens. You go about your routine, but over the day, the pain gets worse. Again, you kind of ignore it. Maybe it's from that small cut that you got the day before. But by the end of the day, you are in excruciating pain. You pull up your pant leg, you have a look. It's very red, it's very swollen. You start to feel a little feverish. What is this? What do I do? The panic sets in. This is a terrifying onset of necrotizing fasciitis, also known as flesh eating disease. So many know that it's a bacterial infection and what happens is it aggressively destroyed your skin and soft tissue. So what causes this bacterial infection? So there are a number of bacteria that can cause necrotizing fasciitis. One of the most common is Streptococcus pyogenes. Many of you may have heard it referred to as group A strep. Another one is Staphylococcus aureus. Most people have heard of a staph infection. These don't always cause necrotizing fasciitis, but many of the people who have necrotizing fasciitis will have one of these two bacteria. Another one that you may not have heard of yet, but you probably will in the near future, is Vibrio vulnificus. So this bacteria is on the rise, both in infections and as a causal agent of necrotizing fasciitis. So where do you get this bacteria? Well, let's say you go to the beach and there's some salt water and this bacteria is present and you have a small cut on your leg and you're in the water. This bacteria may enter and cause an infection that could turn into necrotizing fasciitis. The other way that people get Vibrio is through eating raw or undercooked oysters or shellfish which is why we don't recommend those. So what happens in terms of getting this infection? How do you acquire this? So it can be anything from a surgery or all the way to an insect bite. So something that you wouldn't normally think of as problematic. So it can be very minor and the bacteria will gain entry through anywhere in the skin where it has lost its integrity and is not able to protect against this bacteria. So the bacteria enters and very rapidly and aggressively can cause tissue damage. So the damage occurs, uh, say for group A strep, it has enzymes and exotoxins that will really rapidly destroy the tissue and also cut off the blood supply, which makes it really difficult to treat. So what is the process of infection? So once it gains entry and it starts producing these exotoxins and the infection starts, then it will eventually cause tissue damage and it can become necrotic. So essentially the tissue becomes so damaged you have cell death. So what are the symptoms to look out for if you think that maybe somebody you know or yourself could have an infection like this that could turn into necrotizing fasciitis? The most common of course is going to be pain, swelling, redness, particularly if it's disproportionate to the amount of, say, an insect bite or a small cut, and you think, wow, that's a lot of pain for such a small injury. And if it rapidly becomes red and swollen, and then if untreated, you might get fever, feeling of generally unwell. Obviously, if the symptoms progress and still untreated, then the tissue, let's say it's on your hands, might become bluish to gray, and it's still untreated, it's going to become necrotic and black. Obviously, hugely problematic. You may also at that point experience symptoms such as low blood pressure, and you may also have multi-organ failure. And I think we all know what the potential outcome of all of that would be. So how do we diagnose this? So in the laboratory, uh, we might receive, so a physician would take a uh, culture, so whether it's tissue or swabs, send them to the microbiology lab and hope that they can identify the bacteria responsible for the infection and also do uh, susceptibility testing to see if it's resistant to any potential antibiotics that they might want to treat with. 
the other thing is you can do imaging, so CT and MRIs to see the extent of tissue damage. Uh, but really the definitive is going to be surgery. So when, uh, say, an incision is made and it doesn't bleed, as I mentioned, that it really rapidly cuts off the blood supply, and so therefore that tissue is dead and it won't bleed, and therefore surgical uh, intervention is needed. So how common is this? Well, in the U.S., about 600 to 700 cases of necrotizing fasciitis are diagnosed each year, so this is a rate of about 0.4 per 100,000. So fairly rare. However, when people, uh, even if they're recognized and treated, it's about a one in five case fatality rate. So that's pretty high for a bacterial infection. How do we treat this infection? Well, the first thing, of course, is gonna be IV antibiotics, broad spectrum until or unless you know what bacteria it is and if it's resistant to anything in particular. However, as I mentioned, the tissue death and the uh, limited blood supply can really make it difficult for the antibiotics to reach the bacteria and kill the bacteria inf effectively. So really surgery is going to be the best option here, although probably not best in terms of what the patient wants, but to save their life, infection uh, is going to spread without surgery. So of course they'll start conservative if they're able to, depending on how early an individual shows up with a necrotizing fasciitis and that it's identified as such. But really, unfortunately, amputation is very often the case. And this can be anything from a single, say, digit to multiple uh, limbs. And obviously, it will continue up as the infection spreads. But really, the aim there is to stop it from spreading, moving into bloodstream, causing sepsis, and obviously, uh, severe uh, outcomes, including death in that there are adjunct therapies as well, things like hyperbaric oxygen chambers. Now, not necessarily considered a treatment per se, but these can be used if they're available to assist and improve the outcomes. So by having more oxygenation, then increasing blood flow, allowing the antibiotics to work more effectively and rapidly, and these can improve, hopefully, the outcome for the patient. Now, some of the things that researchers have been working on and medicine, of course, is vaccines. If we can stop the infection from ever occurring or from the infection moving into a necrotizing fasciitis state, of course, that is the best possible thing is to prevent infection. Another really interesting area is phage therapy. So many of you know bacteriophages are little viruses that specifically attack bacteria, and they will work on specific types of bacteria, and they can be applied directly to the site of infection. And so therefore, if you have an antibiotic-resistant infection, then phage have a potential to be able to kill that bacteria without requiring antibiotics. So this is a really promising area, not only for necrotizing fasciitis, but a number of different infections. So in summary, necrotizing fasciitis is a formidable enemy. You have to act swiftly, identify, and provide treatment as quickly as possible. But there are new treatments and medical advances that are improving the outcomes for those who get this very rare but very difficult to treat and often fatal infection. Thank you.